This video is part one of two videos where I'll be creating a simple character selection scene using Unity and Bolt Visual Scripting. I'll be using application variables to transfer data from one scene to another scene, and then using this data to be able to load the character that the player has chosen. I'll be using the same scene and project files as I did in the previous save data video, but I will not be building on any of that work. However, just like in that previous video, I'll include a link to the assets as well as the entire project in the video description below. So if that sounds useful, then let's get started. Before I get into the coding, I'm going to create three scene variables. These are going to hold references to game objects so I can easily access them in my flow graph. The first scene variable, I'll call it left button. The second, I'll call it right button. And the third will be character platform. And all of these variables will be of type game object. The left and right buttons will rotate the character platform to give visual feedback as to what character has been selected. I'll then drag in the corresponding game objects from the hierarchy. The character platform is an empty object that is apparent to the platform that the characters have been placed on. And then the left and right arrows are hopefully self-explanatory as they are buttons with arrows in the UI. I'll be putting all the code for the character selector into a single flow macro and I'll be calling that character selector. It'll be placed into a flow machine on the character selector game object in the hierarchy. The code will have a couple big chunks. The first is to enable the rotation of the platform to give a visual indication of the character selection. The second and more complicated piece is to encode that selection. But let's start with the easy bits. I'm going to start by dragging in a get variable unit that references the left button. I'll then add an on button click and connect the two units like so. This allows this flow macro to register clicks on a button component without needing to be on the same game object. Next, I'll drag out the flow and search for transform rotate and I'll choose the option with axes and angle input parameters. I need to tell the code what object to rotate, so I'll drag in a reference to the character platform game object and connect it to the transform rotate unit. To complete the rotation, I need to tell the transform rotate unit which axis to rotate on. And in this case, I'm going to be rotating on the vertical or Y axis. So I'll change the Y value to 1 and leave the X and Z as 0. I also need to tell it how much to rotate. Now in my case, I only have three characters, so I want the platform to rotate 120 degrees. I then need to repeat the same process, but using the right button and rotating negative 120 degrees instead of a positive 120 degrees. With this done, I'll give it a quick test to make sure that the code is working. You may notice that there's a little blurring when the platform rotates. I've used some post-processing effects, including motion blur. Now I think it would look better if I'd used some tweening, but tweening is not supported out of the box with Bolt at the moment, so I've elected to keep it simple. Before I dig into the more complex code, I need to create a couple of application variables. These will store information about the characters and the player's choice. Application variables, as the name suggests, are scoped application-wide, meaning the values saved will be available to all objects in all scenes throughout your entire project. The first application variable I'll create, I'll call character list, and will be a list of game objects. I'm then going to add three items to the list. Each of these items will be a different character that the player can select. Now for the way I'm creating this selector, these game objects should be the prefabs that have all the code needed for the player to control the character in another scene. And the order that you add the items to the list is very important and needs to match the order on the screen. For my case, based on what I'm going to be creating, when I press the left arrow button, I want to select the next character in the list. And to be honest, when I did this, my little brain hurt, so when I did it, I mostly figured out the list and the order using trial and error and finally got it right. The second and last application variable that I need to create, I'll call character index, and it'll be of type integer. This will essentially keep track of which character in the list the player has chosen. And as almost always, this isn't the only way to do it, but tracking an index rather than say a game object or prefab is a bit more abstract, but it keeps the code simpler, which is almost always a good thing to do. As a further side note, for the rest of the video, I'm going to be describing more of the concept behind the code and less about small steps of how to create the code. If you've made it this far into my videos, I'm assuming you've worked with Bolt a fair amount and know how to add units, can connect them, and other such mechanical bits of Bolt. But on the other hand, we all know what happens when you assume things, so leave me some feedback in the comments below. And now back to the code. When the left arrow button is pressed, the character index will increment or increase by one, 
which is a pretty simple thing to do. But when I get to the end of the list, I need to start back with an index of zero so I can start at the beginning of the list and the cycle can continue. To do this, I'll first go to full screen mode to get a little more room to work on my flow macro as the code's gonna get a bit bigger. I'll then drag in a reference to the character index and add one to the current value of the index. I then want to compare this new value to the number of elements or count of the character list. I'll do this with an equal to or greater than unit and I'll use a branch to test the resulting Boolean. If the index is equal to or greater than the count, I've reached the end of the list and need to reset the index and start back at the beginning of the list. If this is the case, I'll simply set the character index to a value of zero using a set variable unit and an integer literal. On the other hand, if the index is not equal to or greater than the count, that means I'm still in the middle of the list and I will set the value of the character index to the current value plus one and I'll do it like so. Finally, I'll add a box around this chunk of code to visually separate it from the next bit of code. So I need to do the exact same thing, but in reverse for the right arrow. In this case, I need to subtract one from the character index and then compare that value to zero to see if I've reached the beginning of the list. To do this, I'll drag in a reference to the character index, subtract one from the value, I'll then check if this value is less than zero and use a branch to evaluate the resulting Boolean. If the value is less than zero, I need to start over at the end of the list. Since the count is always one larger than the largest index, I need to set the character index to one less than the count and I'll do this using a subtract unit. If the value of the character index minus one is not less than zero, that means I'm still in the middle of my list so I'll simply set the character index to the current value minus one, and I'll do that like so. The last step to finish off this code, I'm just gonna do a little reorganizing and add another box around this code to keep it visually neat and tidy. This is the bulk of the code that needs to happen. And while we're not done with the character selector, we can test this code to make sure it's incrementing through the list correctly. In play mode, I can see that when I press the right arrow, the index goes from zero to two to one and back to zero. Then pressing the left arrow, I can see the index growing larger and wrapping around correctly as intended. So both chunks of code are working. Now there are a few more details and small flow macros that need to be created for the system to be fully functional. And I'm going to put those into the next video. For those who don't want to wait, you may already have enough to spawn your character using the two application variables, that being the character list and the character index. So in the next video, I'll be adding the ability to display the name of the character being selected at the top of the screen, as well as the ability to load another scene and spawn the chosen character into that scene. If you found this video useful, please think about hitting the subscribe and like buttons. If you wanna go even further in supporting the channel, check out the links on the screen or in the video description below. So until next time, happy game designing.